Hello, welcome to Furious Driving, and today I'm at the wheel of a 200 pound 2004, that's a 17 year old Rover 25. And the thing about this, apart from the price, is this thing is ULEZ compliant. By driving this car, the owner doesn't have to pay to take his car into London. How on earth does that happen? And what's a 25 like to drive anyway? If you like this kind of video talking about cars and car culture and things, then please do hit the subscribe button before we carry on. I do appreciate that, thank you. Hello, welcome to Furious Driving, and today we're talking about a new scourge on the streets of London and an unlikely saviour. Now, if you live in London or one of the major cities of this country, there's a new thing on the streets called ULEZ, Ultra Low Emission Zones, which means if you drive into the centre parts of the town, you have to pay up to £17.50 a day, which is a huge amount of money if you've already paid for your car and paid your road tax and everything else. And what they're trying to do is stop people driving older, smoky, polluting cars into the city. However, this is a very broad brush approach because it just carte blanche stops people driving cars they can afford or have collected or want into their homes in many cases. So what people feel they're having to do is to go and take their car, which may be 10 years old and a perfectly good car, or a car they've struggled to afford because they're on a low wage, and trade it in for something they perhaps can't afford or they won't be able to afford and will be forced out of owning a car at all. But there is a solution, a loophole if you like. Because although on the front of the website it says your car needs to be Euro 6 compliant, it's actually not the only restriction. It's more to do with emissions, actual exact tailpipe emissions coming out of the back of the car. And that means this 200 pound Rover is safe to drive into London without extracting a fee from you every time you turn a wheel. So first of all, let's take a little look around this 2004 Rover 25. Now the overall shape of the 25 goes back all the way to 1995 with the new 200R3, which had been an exciting new bubble-shaped aerodynamic future rover, which was revamped in 1999 for the 2000 model year as the 25. It got new headlamps, new bumpers, new interiors, and new wheels. Not that much really changed under the skin, of course. It was still a Rover 200R3 underneath, of course. But less than a year after the car was launched, BMW sold Rover to the Phoenix Consortium for just £10, and that was kind of the death knell for the company. And the 25 soldiered on until 2005, when the company went down taking the car with it. This being a 2004 is a very late example of the pre-facelift uh, double headlamp cars, which took the Rover 75 style, the front end styling, and applied it to the smaller cars. The 45s, of course, got this as well. And so as well as the twin headlights, the indicators moved down here, below the lamps into the bumper and above the fog light. Other differences included the little ridge in the bonnet, different mirrors, and the bumper's now got rubbing strips on the corners, which I think detract from the overall look of the car, to be honest. Now, when the car was relaunched as the 25, it was repositioned as a smaller car, so it's competing with things like the Fiesta rather than the Focus now. The idea being that the 45 was going to be repositioned to compete rather oddly with the Focus and the Astra and so forth. In the wings, of course, behind the scenes, BMW had been developing a new car to fit into that size segment, which never saw the light of day. But uh, prototypes and sketches and designs do indicate that perhaps that design did become the BMW 1 series in the end. Meanwhile, MG Rover may do with pushing the uh, old 200R3 on a little bit longer. Under the bonnet, that meant there was a choice of engines from 1.4, 1.6 and 1.8 petrol and a 2-litre diesel. The petrols are all 16-valve apart from the 1.4, which became a 16-valve in autumn 2002. There was a variety of gearbox options as well. For the 1.4 and the 1.6, the R65 manual gearbox carried over, but the 1.8 got the PG1. There's a CVT step speed semi-automatic, which sounds troublesome to me. Now, climbing inside the car, there are a few differences, but mostly it's more of the same, because Rover didn't really have much money to make very many changes to the overall structure of the car. So the bubble dashboard is uh, still very much exactly the same. You'll find this in also the convertibles, uh, Tauras, and the coupes after the facelift time as well, because they weren't making the old square style dashboards in the molding factory anymore. So everything got this right up pretty much to the bitter end. It was the details that changed. So things like the door cards have been slightly reworked. So we've now got a large speaker and a tweeter, and these slash shaped door handles are completely new. And they follow that slashing angle down into the door pull, which is obviously only plastic with a different kind of plastic and this is a hard and plasticky material rather than a soft fabric on the earlier cars. We do, however, get a fairly sizable door bin and a little notch out in the middle to put your bottles there if you want to. 
things that have carried over from forever are these uh, mirror adjusters and headlamp levelers. And the steering wheel, although it does have a new centre cap, is still the same firm leather steering wheel. It always has been with the steering wheel controls for the volume and channels. And of course we still have the horn buttons in the same place. Horn test. Still poppy. Ah, behind the steering wheel we have got tucked away these exact same stalks we've found in Rover R8s and indeed many, many Hondas for many, many years. They're a great design. If it ain't broke, don't fix. They're one of the most lovely, positively clickety, nice bits of kit to use in any car. So it's a good thing they didn't try and redesign. You can't reinvent the wheel sometimes. Well, something we have gained is this little coin holder down here just behind the steering wheel, almost invisible but it is down there better than the right hand one which has a habit of dropping coins into the top of the fuse box. And glancing down to the centre console we find they've added a touch of spritz of excitement by turning this little panel here which used to be uh, fake wood coloured into body colour blue. It is of course still exactly the same controls as previously but with just slightly different graphics all around it. This has no longer got its Rover radio, it's got a Sony instead which uh, will announce itself every time you turn the car off with this little pip pop pip pop reminding you you're in the vicinity of a Sony head unit. Underneath that we've got the 12 volt socket, we've got a sweetie wrapper tray and we've still got, even in 2004, we've got a four cassette slot holder for stopping your tapes rattling around in the dashboard. Did they even still make tapes in 2004? I'm unsure what demographic they're aiming for because on the one hand they're trying to make the car look exciting and youthful but on the other hand they're giving you cassette slot holders and up here on the dashboard the dials, like the Rover 75, have got the sepia-toned hint of the 1930s and early 40s when underneath the car they've given a sport suspension. It's somewhat at odds with itself is probably the best way I can describe it. It's not an unattractive look but I don't think it's quite as clear as it would have been back when they were using the old R8 Honda era of font and, and layout. And then of course there is a T-shelf. I didn't even bring a cup with me because there's no T-shelf opportunity in this car because we've got the bubble dash now. And the bubble dash means everything is swoopy and slopey and curvy. No cup holders to carry a cup with you. Nothing to balance it on when you get there. Your only picnicking opportunity is to bring a flask in a basket in the boot and then perch it precariously between the air vent and the clock. Moving back, we've got our excessively chunky manual gear knob. Five-speed manual. I say it's huge, it's, I've got not exactly small hands here and this feels big in my hands. If you're a little old lady buying a Rover you might find this a tad excessive but then maybe you go for the automatic. That's got a vinyl uh, boot around it and behind that saving the expense of putting switches on both doors which cost a lot of money we've got our twin front window switches down here in the centre console. Looking quickly at the seats, this car is loaded. We've got a full leather interior here. We've got the leather steering wheel and we've got these leather seats. It's a similar design to the 200 bubble, but when it was still called the 200 bubble, but a little simplified perhaps. So we've just got these five simple panels, top and bottom, and a plain area and just simple perforation. So they've kept the manufacturer and complexity down to the bare minimum. Headroom wise is not too bad. There's a bit of a ceiling droop here which makes me think it's lower than it really is. This car does have a sunroof, it is the electric variety um, which means you are encroached a little bit more in your headroom. But right now let's climb in the back and see what that's like. Climbing in the rear we've got very similar door cards, the same slashy door handle into a slashy door pull on the same hard plastic textured material. We've only got wind-up windows though, no exciting electric windows for the rear seat passengers, very much in the cheap seats. Now this is an area that came in for some criticism being quite tight. Now this is a five door version rather than three door. The floor pan is the same though, but you do just have easier access because you've got your own door. Now I'm set up for my five foot 11 height and I've actually got a kind of okay knee room back here. It's not exactly bursting with space, but it's not massively uncomfortable either. I wouldn't want to run it as a mini cab, put it that way. But if I had a family doing occasional journeys, wouldn't be a problem. In terms of equipment, uh, they had started tearing things down pretty hard. You've still got um, back seat pockets, but you haven't got grab handles up here anymore. You can feel through the sagging heat headlining where they should be screwed in, but you haven't got them. Just one centre light, which is the same as you'll find in 25, 200s, going back many, many, many years, unchanged at all. I think the coupe and the convertible both got exactly the same light as that. And the seat itself does have a little fold down armrest, no cup holders literally anywhere and it's a 60-40 folding seat to a not exactly enormous boot. 
Now one area of the car which always came in for criticism was the boot because it uses a cut down floor pan from the R8. It was always just a bit small for a family car. When you're going up against things like the Escort, the Focus, the Astra, Peugeot 306, they're always going to wipe the floor with a boot of this size. Right, so let's take this ULEZ exempt Rover 25 out on the road. Now before we get going, we'll mention this now has a Pectron immobilizer and ECU system, as opposed to your MEMS 3 system which the Rovers used to have. This is a big advantage in that it's a Faction Cat 1, a bit more reliable, but if you lose the keys, it's very difficult, not even impossible in fact, to replace them. So if you've got a car with just one of these oval egg-shaped keys, make sure you get a second one made immediately. Otherwise, if you lose it, your car is dead. So pulling away into London with the K-Series engine. These things are always peppy and revy and willing to drive. They're kind of wasted in a 30 mile an hour zone because they are absolute screamers of engines that just want to be revving to the limit. The R65 gearbox is still a nice shifter when it's in young, good condition. This car's only got 60,000 miles on it, so it does still feel tight. It's a, a nice light throw. It's not too far from the forward to the back ratios. I mean, of the planes, not the direction the car's going in. So a lot of people with cars that are around 10, 15 years old are now looking at them, realizing they can't drive into city centres or even now the peripheral areas of cities. And my favourite parking zone for catching the train or the tube into London is now inside the ULEZ zone. So I can't even do that on the rare occasions I go into London. So I'll be going there even less in the future. However, the owner of this car lives on the outskirts and needs to go in fairly regularly. So what does he do? Buy himself a new finance wagon? No, he buys himself a £200 Rover 25. Admittedly, you're not going to find that many £200 Rovers or similar in the classifieds. In this particular case, the car was dead in the water. The reason being, it turned out, was because the uh, key fob had got a flat battery. So that was a fairly easy fix. He got lucky in that particular case. And what you're looking for with a ULEZ compliant car isn't necessarily just a Euro 4 for petrol, Euro 6 for diesel. It's actually the tailpipe emissions. It's got to be below a certain level of CO2. Now I won't list that now because I'm sure they will change the goalposts before too long. And if you're watching this video in six months time, it'll be irrelevant. So just go and Google that and I'm sure it'll be the first thing that comes up. Now the crazy thing is, Rover 200s and earlier 25s are not Eulers exempt because they don't have their tailpipe emissions stamped on the V5. This one though, being a newer car, with its CO2 emissions stamped on the V5, thanks to the fact that they added extra lambda sensors, they've got two lambda sensors now, means that this one, despite having exactly the same engine as an identical 200, which would arguably be a better built car with a better engine and a better interior. This one is safe to drive into London without being fined, but the old 200s aren't. It's a little bit crazy when you think of it that way. So really the simplest thing to do if you've got a car you think might be ULEZ compliant is type in the number plate onto the checker and then it will come up with a yes or a no based on that individual car. If you've got a car you know will be, but it isn't showing up as, you can have it independently checked as well. It costs a couple of hundred pounds, but if you're planning on driving in fairly regularly, it can be worthwhile doing. The other option, of course, is to go and get yourself a car that is over 40 years old. It's a rolling 40-year exemption. Same as on the MOT and the road tax. You do have to apply for it still, though. It's not automatic. The only exemption to that would be if you're using the car for, let's say, for example, a catering track a commercial purpose for your classic car, put it that way. Unless, of course, it's older than January the 1st, 1973, in which case you're exempt from absolutely everything, whether you're being commercial or not. But you do still have to apply. So really what you need to do is go and learn the specific tailpipe emissions of every model of a car you want, dependent on year and engine size. And then you can get yourself a dirt cheap, run around a ULEZ beater, like a winter beater, but for going into London with. This car at £200 is not the smartest thing you've ever seen. The front wing has taken a knock in the past and has been rattle canned. It's got bits of moss growing in it. The wheels are a bit scuffed. 
but at 200 pounds that means it's not a car you're going to worry about in the centre of London and the owner can keep his big Jaguar at home on the days when he needs to drive into town. Shall we talk about the Rover 25 now? I think we shall. These were always great cars to drive because they're based on the Rover R8 which was already a great car to drive in itself. Now possibly one of the most interesting decisions of remodelling the 200 as the 25 was the suspension choice given the fact they're giving it sepia tone vintage look um, dials and cassette holder slots down in the dashboard they also gave it the sport suspension from the VI so this thing does ride an awful lot more firm and more sportily than the old 200 ever did apart from the VI of course which it rides the same as you can imagine them wanting to try and get a more youthful market more youthful demographic into the cars so putting a bit of a hot suspension setup on it would make the car feel a bit more sporty and fun it might draw some younger folk in from the test drive into the salesman's desk to sign the paperwork who knows oh a cube when the 200 became the 25 there were a few trim levels to choose from the most basic of course was the i then there was the ie these were well fairly basic and spartan then you got the is and the il and finally the gti there was a, a hot 1.8 VVC version which replaced the uh, VI and the uh, VRM and then in 2002 a new range topper appeared the IXL fully loaded with leather and all the toys blimey a twizzy that's really cool I haven't really experienced much handling driving around housing estates and high streets but chucking around this roundabout you can feel the car is taut and well willing and willing to just grip onto the road even on the fairly old tires it's riding on today it doesn't feel like it's a car that's going to give up on you at any time Ford's design guru Richard Parry Jones used to say that there was a 50 meter test that a good chassis engineer should be able to tell how good a car was just by driving it just 50 meters at relatively low speed and just feel what the car is doing underneath him oh no too many and uh, driving a car like this even at low speed around the estates you might be thinking how can I tell if this is good or not you've not taken it to the raggedy edge but you can you can see how well the steering turns the steering is the steering for example is just heavy enough to give feedback and reassurance that the car is doing what you want it to do so you can feel which way the wheels are going feel what's happening under the tires but at the same time light enough that it's not wearing on a long journey the suspension being that sportier type is lithe and tight so you can twitch around the car and it will do what you want it to do the brakes fortunately are very good as well and the K-Series always has that terrific gruff sound, that willingness to rev. So pulling in second gear to get a little bit of oomph, keeping it at low speed though. Oh wow, such a responsive car. So going back to the old emissions and ULEs whatnot, the fact is that if you can buy a car and keep it running, if you're not going to be doing big miles in it, ecologically, there's an argument that you're doing better for the world by not buying a new car because the bulk of a car's emissions occur during manufacture. It could take up to 50,000 miles to recoup and offset the uh, manufacture CO2 in terms of driving in a more e efficient car. So if you're not doing big miles, only occasional journeys, then surely it makes more sense to keep a car running a bit longer. This is the heart of the classic movement really these days is all about sustainability don't build a new car maintain an old one it's good for the economy and it's good for the environment and if you're a car enthusiast living inside one of these terrible traps it does open up a world of other vehicles more modern classics that maybe you can if you're going to have to sell your treasured car move over to instead these days the classifieds are absolutely littered with bargain cars from sad owners or having to sell them because they're being forced out of their cherished collector car because it's no longer ULEZ compliant which is very sad indeed cherished and well-maintained Saabs, Volvos, Granadas all sorts of interesting 80s and 90s barges late 90s sports cars that just no longer pass the test are winding up 
being sold reluctantly to people who live in the countryside. Well, thank you for joining me on the streets of London in a 200 quid Rover. There's no place that's ever really bad in a Rover. After all, relax, it's a Rover. I do admire the owner and his amazing workaround so you can avoid having to pay horrific amounts of money just to keep on going where he wants to go. And with a little bit of clever searching, perhaps you can too. You don't need to be in a PCP mobile. You can be driving something affordable and perhaps doing even more for the environment by not making a new car have to be built just for occasional short journeys. I hope you've enjoyed this video. If you have, then please do hit like and subscribe and join me again next time driving something completely different. Mm-hmm.